selected a little phenomenon uh, of putting in a juxtaposition the situation after the First World War in Czech Republic and after 1989. And um, it, the connecting line is actually the style of modernism. So if I start, I mean, the reference uh, is beautiful city of Prague, where I wasn't born, but where I lived before I came to England, and which is a medieval city, which of course during the period of um, 1920, let's say 25, up to the Second World War, just of really flourished in um, using the international style of modernism. And when I went to Prague after 22 years, uh, when I first returned after 1968, I realized how strong this influence was because you have never seen more flat roofs in any city in the world that you see in Prague <laughs> when you come down from the airport among all those baroque and little uh, red roofs. So you have got all these examples in Gothic architecture next to uh, the real modernism. That is an equivalent of Weissenhof in Stuttgart, a building that is a proof of what I'm saying, it's right, it's a building exhibition in Prague from 1925. And all these buildings, which you find in good or bad shape, but you see that the technology which really dictated the rules of this modernism just really started and really rooted deeply. And of course, it, it was the final presentation of how far the modernism in Czech Republic got was a presentation of the Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak pavilion at the World Exhibition in Paris in 1937, when it really dominated by this absolutely incredible architectural phenomenon of using technology, including the lighting, including the presentation. One can't say the same about the presentation of the Czech pavilion. But now I'm going to actually not talk about Prague because it would be easy. But I'm going to concentrate on something which you may not know so well, which is a town where I was born, so therefore it's important. But now, and apart from me, there was also Martina Navratilova and, <laughs> and um, um, Ivana Trump. And I who came from a little village with practically no education and who appointed architects to do urban planning for different uh, places in India, all over the world, where he wanted to open his new uh, little um, cities based on working and, and uh, uh, cultural experience. He had a system that every single person in his uh, um, factory had to start working uh, and making shoes, so he went through all the different processes of um, learning how the trade actually functions. They had three evenings a week of further education, and they had, and I have to amuse you because I smell the old rat. And the Second World War came, and after the Second World War, the communism completely destroyed all the production because they did not know how to, uh, how to produce the shoes properly, so they started losing the foreign market. They were making shoes which, uh, which were low in quality, and so the factories were more or less abandoned. So we, uh, that was a period which lasted up to 1989, and in 1989, the factories really run down. So there was a fantastic change. And that is something which uh, I have to say, I use this then not only because it is the time you know, which I know so, so well, but because this Lynn was the only town which really recovered from this complete destruction. Complete, there was really in, let's say, 1990, 1992, when I came to Zlin for the first time, there was no development. People moved out. It really was in a completely devastated state. What happened that the University of Zlin, which called, him, called itself the University of Thomas Bata, so this university <coughs> started building up the education process and system. The university is now, I think, 15,000 students. 
in a town of 70,000 inhabitants. So therefore, the university is really um, a leading element in the progress of Zlin. And we were lucky enough to win the competition in Zlin for the center of Zlin where there used to be Masaryk schools. Masaryk schools were the schools for further education. So university started developing the building, which is a university library. And the Zlin, with European money, from, uh, just to follow that building, a Philharmonic Orchestra building, which became um, a multi-purpose auditorium, because European money had to be used in that sense, and built this building. So I just to show you, you know, on, a, on which scale this little town of 70,000 people just have managed to build the university library when you have uh, on one side the library building, on the other side the buildings of the rector and the administration of the university with the atrium connecting the space, that is the library meeting, meeting room. Again, you can see all these that is a building which is just waiting for a planning approval, so it continues. It's a, it's a faculty of, of arts and um, all that old development around it. Zlin is building another a little quarter, which is, which is the housing on the other side. But um, considering the, uh, m when you go back again to what is the modernism seek inspiration in technology, but we saw the inspiration in biology <laughs> for a change. So this is the principle, how the roof of the building of this um, elliptical shape is actually done with um, references to um, material which Bata used in, in his buildings, concrete structure. And few details which probably are boring you with <laughs> the inside of the auditorium and 1200 uh, seat inside of the building and that is the building in the sunshine. It is important in architecture I see it how you distinguish between men and women but this time it was a disaster because men did not want to be <laughs> That deer is always a sign of a man who is cheating, so, so we just don't have a little bit of a problem getting it through. And I think that one thing which I think probably connected us with previous architects of the period is that you always go through the same system. You start, you go up and down through dead ends, mess ups, you get back lost, you go right, pay detour, through who knows, maybe. Then you go around the circle, you, and that is the introduction of experience, understanding, courage, great deal of luck, a little bit of talent, huge deal of modesty, discipline, and effort forms a sea made of sweat and hard work. Most of the time, you miss the target. Sometimes you have got a near miss, and hardly ever you hit it. Except, you know, I have to say that that period now let's say between the two wet walls did hit it. It took 25 years to build Zlin. We took 12 years to build those two buildings. We are still for the last three years waiting for permission to build a third one. So the, the, having said that I'm going to put in a juxtaposition, you know, the situation after the first war, this enthusiasm which was also combined with the full support of um, all the authorities, I don't think that Butter had any problems with planning authorities and you know, when he started building his town and then he was asking international architects to come and give him expertise. You know, we just uh, had to go around in circles, really in circles so many times before we, we had a permission to build a building and when we get it, so few people just have decided that they were going to oppose to it. So, and that process, I think, it really, really, somehow, um, in not only in material terms, but in decisiveness, lack of enthusiasm, it really blocks uh, 
the future development and the fact that when you look at how many buildings were built over 25 years, if I say in Prague, so Lynn is exceptional because Lynn has got at least the center and the new housing. But most of the towns and most of and parts of Czech Republic we have got just a few development um, uh, schemes which are partially realized, bad architecture, and yet mainly done by developers and design and build. Thank you very much. I think that my time is up. <laughs> The title of my presentation uh, suggests uh, the cinematic projections of national histories in the post-war period. However, uh, needless to say, due to the bre brevity of my presentation, um, I decided to focus on just three groups of historical films made in the late um, 1950s and 1960s. Uh, that is the Polish school. Uh, Miklos Jancho's uh, historical films made in the 1960s and then uh, two specific aspects that really belong actually to the phenomenon of the uh, Czechoslovak New Wave. Now, each set of these films um, demonstrates different takes on, on national histories. However, what unifies uh, these films can be summarized in few points. First, um, all three groups represent the golden periods of Polish, Hungarian, and Czech and Slovak film industries. Second, um, we deal with state-owned filmmaking, which, however, was decentralized at times. And here of particular importance is the institution of film production units that often thrived in Central Europe, <coughs> constituting uh, some kind of form of artistic collectives populated by, uh, populated by filmmakers, filmmakers, uh, directors, scriptwriters, writers, etc., etc. And I think we can find actually this specific phenomenon largely responsible for the golden era in uh, the three uh, aforementioned uh, film industries. And the third point is that um, all these three sets demonstrate basically a very important role of specific political and historical contexts in the treatment of national past and collective memory. So let me start actually with um, my homeland, uh, the, Polish, uh, the Polish school, or what I call actually the two Polish schools uh, of the 1950s and 1960s. Let me go to the first one. And here you can see actually the giant, uh, the two giant figures of the Polish school, um, Andrzej Wajda and Andrzej Munk. Um, the Polish school, <coughs> which blossomed after the end of Stalinism, focused on the wartime experience, questioning uh, the Polish nationalist canon and its glorification of romantic heroism and martyrdom. And I think that Andrzej Munk and Andrzej Wajda were interested in offering some kind of therapy to the historically brutalized and politically confused war generation, rather than uh, in legitimizing uh, the, party, uh, the party state. Um, here, for example, you have the first film, which is very often considering as the opening movie of the Polish film school, Andrzej Wajda's generation from 1955, blending basically the cinematic influence of Italian neorealism and socialist realism, but also introducing Andrzej Wajda's romantic expressionist and baroque style. Needless to say, we also basically have The Return of the Repressed, 1956, <coughs> and Andrzej Wajda's film Canal on the doomed struggle of the Warsaw uh, uh, insurgents in Warsaw in 1945. And obviously his treatise on Polishness and the essence of Polishness, uh, that is Ashes and Diamonds from 1958, which really actually introduces Vida's Baroque uh, uh, style. Um, in the case of Munch, if Vida basically stands you know, for this romantic expressionist style, in the case of Munch we can actually talk about more realistic and even plebeian 
uh, style, more rationalistic. Um, Moon basically came from the uh, tradition of documentary filmmaking, and that can be somehow depicted in his uh, uh, brief uh, 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 career, which basically uh, uh, ended in 1961 after he died in a car crash, uh, while shooting basically The Passenger, his last movie about, about Auschwitz. Here you have essentially Eroica, a very different type than Vidas on Polish uh, uh, struggles. Um, and in the first novella of the movie, you have the profiteer and a drunkard <coughs> turned basically into a hero and a messenger uh, between um, the home army struggling to liberate Warsaw and the Hungarian units which are basically ready to join the insurgents provided that they are going to receive uh, some sort of guarantees from the Soviet army. Needless to say, it doesn't happen. In the case of the second novella in this movie, this is a, a very bleak, uh, but also somehow satirical treatment of Polish POWs cultivating their militaristic rituals um, at the POW camp. And we also have Bad Luck from 1960, um, which is basically a story of an opportunist. This is what Moon basically admitted himself. A man who is, to some extent, a victim of a history uh, history which essentially is the laboratory of various forms of authoritarian regimes being authoritarian uh, regime of Sanatia in the 1930s then needless to say we have basically World War II and then afterwards the last segment of the movie is dealing with, uh, with Stalinism. Now Munch's and Vida's international success did not shield them from the criticism of Władysław Gomułka's watchdogs uh, the 1960 resolution of the Central Committee uh, Secretariat of the uh, some Polish film, particularly Munch's films, for the pessimism, Western influences and disagreement with the party's program. The condemnation, this condemnation coupled with the death of Munch in 1961 essentially marked the end of the Polish school, <coughs> but it also led to the creation of what I call the second Polish school, that is the National Communist Cinema. The National Communist Cinema, which unlike the first Polish school, was supportive of the regime, promoted the myth of the all-embracing, united and victorious anti-Nazi anti struggle and projected People's Poland as the ultimate result of nation-building processes. And I think the director who was really uh, the most pivotal and important when it comes to National Communist Cinema in Poland was Jerzy Passendorfer, who was essentially blending Marxist political correctness or national communist ideology of Gomuka with the format of popular mainstream cinema. Because if you have Answer to Violence from 1951, 59, which was his um, reconstruction of the assassination of uh, uh, Kuchera, the head of the Gestapo and police in Warsaw in 1944 by the Home Army, um, we essentially have the format of the heist movies. Whereas in the case of Colors of Struggle, which was the adaptation of autobiography of Mieczysław Moczar, the Minister of Internal Affairs and the leader of the Partisans faction, we essentially have even the elements of Western um, um, uh, and combat drama and various action flicks. But let me move to Hungary now, uh, because we have also a very important personality here, and that is basically Miklos Miklos Jancho and his reflections on violence and, and authority. And um, I think it's enough basically to mention two of his films made in the 1960s. Uh, uh, Consider the Roundup of 1965, which was basically the sensational entry into Cannes Festival a year uh, later. Um, it, is, it is a story basically of, um, um, uh, uh, of post 1848 repression, at least on the surface. Uh, we essentially have 1848 rebels turned into bandits, uh, uh, being basically captured by the Habsburg authorities who are playing with them the cat and mouse sadistic game um, of ritual humiliation. And, and, and Jancho was always really interested, particularly in the 1960s, um, uh, uh, in 
uh, uncovering and demonstrating the rituals basically of power. I think one of the reasons for this uh, was definitely the fact that apart from being a filmmaker he was also studying anthropology. What really makes this movie very interesting is that despite of Jancho's statements it is pretty clear that the portrayal of the 1840, post-1848 uh, terror is a proxy for the post-1956 repression of the Qadarist uh, regime. Equally important is definitely his movie from 1967, The Red and the White, uh, on the Russian Civil War, commissioned by the Soviet and Qadarist regimes to commemorate uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. The problem was that Yancho basically showed the cruelty of both sides. Uh, both sides that basically adhere to similar methods of ritualistic humiliation, torture, and crime. Uh, in fact, this big picture actually prompted the Soviet government to ban this movie until the 1980s from the distribution um, in the Soviet Union. And finally, we essentially have some components of the uh, Czechoslovak New Wave, uh, which I think the Czechoslovak New Wave really actually shows not only the explosion of artistic creativity uh, due to ideological and cultural relaxation, but also filmmakers' responses to the Hitherto taboos. Uh, that is the Holocaust and Stalinist purges. And I don't want to argue, basically, that historical themes were at the center of the Czechoslovak new wave. This is not the case. However, we can definitely basically see very innovative movies which were uh, dealing with the specific uh, subjects. Um, consider The Fifth Horseman is Fear by Zdenek Brinik from 1964 and Jan Nemec's uh, Diamonds of the Night, um, which, essentially, uh, 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 um, uh, which essentially demonstrate, reflect, the Czech surrealist uh, tradition. Uh, on the other hand, you also have realistic pictures dealing with the Holocaust. And here, for example, we have two uh, Slovak films from the 1960s, The Shop on Main Street uh, by Jan Kader and Elmar Kloss, and The Boxer and the Death by Peter Solan from 1962. In this respect, we can essentially see um, uh, the banality of evil and corruption of ordinary individuals by authoritarian and uh, criminal uh, regimes. And needless to say, we also basically have a, num a number of Czechoslovak films uh, dealing with uh, Stalinism. Again, some sort of you know realistic portrayal, the adaptation of Milan Kundera's The Job by Jaromir Iresh, or for example, Wojtek Jasny's All My Good uh, Countrymen. And then we also have essentially the sort of absurdist, satiristic, and claustrophobic, and partly surreal uh, films by Jan Nemec, particularly a report on the party and the guests, and Ear by Karel Kachinia. I would like to mention basically that uh, Nemec had to wait for two years for this movie to be released. It was released very briefly in 1968, and then it was immediately banned after the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Uh, in, the case of, in the case of Ir by Karel Kachinia, uh, the, fate was very much, uh, the fate was very much similar. The Czechoslovak audiences were not able to see these films until 1990. Um, the Czechoslovak new wave lasted only for a few years, but to this day it demonstrates how political reforms, the spirit of openness and plurality of views nurture great artistic formations, mobilize complex responses to yesterday's horrors, and help in coming to terms with the past. And we should always keep these lessons in our minds and in our own um, era. Even in the midst of state socialism, Central Europe was capable of producing high culture which didn't shy away from confronting imposed <coughs> lies and demons of humanity. And I really don't know uh, if the same situation applies to presence and to present condition of art um, in, now, in the now democratic and largely prosperous region. What I do know, however, is that such artistic journeys 
tend to mobilize self-discoveries within nations and societies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I must admit it has some charm to talk about Central Europe in the notion of Middle Europa in an institute of archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I will try to show, uh, Middle Europa uh, is uh, still a fruitful topic not only for archaeologists. A successful Austrian invention. This was the title of an article in The Economist about an exhibition that had been designed and organized as a common project of the International Culture Center, ICC, in the southern Polish metropolis, Krakow, and the Wien Museum, the Museum of the City of Vienna. After having successfully been running in Krakow, the exhibition is currently to be seen in the Austrian capital. Its title, The Myth of Galicia. The region of what is called Galicia became part of the Austrian Empire by the first partition of Poland in 1772. In 1804, it was officially uh, declared part of the empire from 1867 until 1980, the uh, end uh, of the monarchy, it was a so-called Kronland, a constitu constituting part of the western half of Austria-Hungary, named Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria. Krakow was the capital of western Galicia, Lemberg the capital of eastern Galicia. Today, Lemberg, as you know, Shulin will know, in Ukrainian language called Lviv, is the metropolis of Western Ukraine. And as such, it is not only a symbol of the European ambitions of the Euromaidan movement, it is also its most important spiritual center. That is why the colleague of The Economist concluded his article <coughs> with the words, I quote, and this invention is, by all its deficiencies, still relevant and alive. End of quotation. What does this relevance mean? Jacek Urchla, the director of the ICC in Krakow, says Galicia is still a key element of identity on both sides of the Polish-Ukrainian border. Its message, back to the values that made Central Europeans Middle Europea, out of us. <coughs> what Jacek Buchla is, re is referring to, during the last period of the Soviet Empire, among art artists and intellectuals in its western so-called satellite states, Middle Europa had become a kind of a subversive project, a symbol for sharing common values with the free part of Europe. Regardless of the real geopolitical circumstances, their respective countries belonged to a common cultural space, didn't they? But by this, the notion of Middle Europa became an eminent political factor too. It contributed to some extent to the disappearance of the Iron Curtain. Quite a similar pattern applies to the uh, Euromaidan movement. To many of, it, of its activists, the heritage uh, of Galicia simply means being part of Europe. And to many analysts inside and outside Russia, this is the very reason for Mr. Putin's military intervention. If Ukraine becomes a functioning, functioning European state <coughs> in terms of rule of law, solid democratic institutions, economic competition, and a vivid civil society, this would have a serious impact on the development in Russia itself. Only a few months before the start of the Euromaidan movement, after President Yanukovych had cancelled the EU association agreement, the Ukrainian uh, chief negotiator and ambassador in Brussels told me in an interview that signing and implementing this agreement would mean to his country what the fall of the Berlin Wall meant to Germany. 
he was not exaggerating, as we meanwhile know. Here again, the myth of Galicia is of great symbolic power. Josef Roth, the famous author and one of the main creators of the Galician myth, was born in Brody, a town at the then border between the Austrian and the Russian Empire. The poster of the Viennese exhibition is a colored photograph from around 1910 showing Austrian and Russian officers, their wives and children, under the open barriers of the border station near Brody. The message is to be understood easily, if one wants to understand. Josef Roth defined Galicia as a Zwischenreich, an empire in between. By this, he referred to the ambiguity of the myth and its numerous contradictions. A world between backwardness and progress, a world of enormous cultural variety, a world where Jewish life experienced a bloom and where the Holocaust took place. Where most, and a world where most of the people spoke at least two languages. <coughs> In this sense, Zwischenreich seems to be an adequate metaphor also for Middle Europa and its lasting relevance. As for the contradictions, just look at the Ukrainian crisis, to crisis again. For an obvious majority of Western Ukrainians, but also for many Russian-speaking Ukrainians who participated in the Maidan movement, or were at least in favor of it, the notion of Middle Europa stands openly articulated or not for European values. But there is another Middle Europa that seems to be not so keen on promoting or defending European values when things are getting uncomfortable. It is the, not a secret that three of the four Visegrad countries, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary, together with Austria, and its present government would stop the sanctions against Russia rather today than tomorrow. Only some months ago, the Czech and the Slovak Prime Minister and the Austrian Chancellor at a meeting in the Czech Republic expressed themselves rather skeptically on continued sanctions against Moscow. This reminds me to an interview with the uh, Ukrainian author well-known Ukrainian author Oksana Sabushko. Uh, about one year ago she told me, we want to continue with our comfortable life until the man with the Kalashnikov knocks on our door. End of quotation. The honorable, honorful reception of Mr. Putin by the highest representatives in Austria and Hungary in the middle of the Ukrainian crisis was not seen as a peculiar sign of European solidarity in other countries of the European Union. <coughs> there lies some historical irony in the notion that a kind of new European alliance could be defined by friendly attitudes towards the new Russian Tsar and his nationalistic, neo-imperialistic policy. This would indeed be a betrayal of the core of Middle Europa. For despite of its vagueness, its uncertitudes and contradictions, this term is an antithesis to nationalism. It contains the conviction, born out of painful experience, that cultural diversity on the basis, on the basis of commonly shared values is a very precious and vulnerable good. We must take care for it not only by passive tolerance, by a kind of laissez-faire, but by constant hard work every day. <coughs> In practical terms, it means, this means, for example, to cope with history in a different way and to start with school books and the manner of teaching history to young people. One need not go as far as Voltaire, who said, I quote, history is the lie historians have agreed upon. <laughs> End of quotation. 
But we all know that individuals as well as communities need myths to give their lives a sense. Here I see one of the main reasons why Mr. Putin still is so successful in telling the Russian people his version of the Ukrainian case. To historicize in a moralizing way would be the main obstacle for mutual understanding. Instead, we should create the myth of ourselves, Grusha claimed. Looking at the Ukrainian conflict, one could speak of a competition of myths. There is a fundamental difference. The Russian myth is a nationalistic one. At least it is being instrumentalized as such. The myth of Middle Europa, or just say Europe instead, is quite the opposite. Drago Janca, the prominent Slovene author, wrote in an essay in 2001, I quote, the idea of Middle Europa was not an ideology. Therefore, it cannot be threatened by downfall or ruin the fate of all ideologies. Middle Europa has experienced both, the coexistence of different cultures and people, enormous creativity and tolerance, as well as national and social hatred, malicious intolerance and violence. To live with this experience means to understand much. It also means to be prepared for the beautiful and the evil surprises that await us in the pan-European context." End of quotation. The development of Europe in the last decade and the current conflicts have proven Jancha right for the better and for the worse. The challenge for creating a common positive myth is greater than ever. To start with, there could be a helpful approach. The Jirji Cistetsky, a young Czech diplomat and at that time Visegrad coordinator of his country, at a meeting in Vienna put it as followed, I quote, we have learned not to agree in a civilized manner, end of quotation. I would call this the myth, the lasting myth of Middle Europa type extra dry. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>